Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. We're now on episode number 593. My name is Camden Busey, and I'm back with another excellent episode. Really excited to, to get together today and speak about uh, an important and always timely subject. We'll get to that in a second. I want to introduce to you our panel. We have first Jeff Waddington, uh, one of the co-founders here of Reformed Forum. He's calling in from Norristown, Pennsylvania. Welcome back, Jeff. It's good to speak with you. Good to be here from Norristown. Did I say it right? You did. Very good. <laughs> I, I would say Norristown, but, uh, the so pe- I, but the people from Norristown say it that way. Anyway, Norristown, yeah. thank you, Jeff. It's good to see you, brother. We're also very pleased to welcome to the program, I believe for the first time on the program, though we've met before, uh, Dr. Richard M. Gamble, who's professor of history, Anna Margaret Ross Alexander Chair in History and Politics at Hillsdale College out in Hillsdale, Michigan. Welcome to the program, Richard. It's great to speak with you. Oh, thanks very much for having me, Camden, and it's good to connect with you too, Jeff. Yes. Yeah. Well, we uh, should clarify, as as uh, most people ought to know, we hope, but we were joking beforehand and how there's often confusion between Richard M. Gamble and Richard C. Gamble, I believe, at R- RPTS, if that's his, his middle initial, I believe. And we yes. recently spoke with Whitney Gamble, uh, who's a tremendous uh, historian, um, and she's the daughter of the other <laughs> Richard Gamble. So uh, we're speaking uh, with the, the Richard Gamble at Hillsdale College, who's written a tremendous book. He's written several books and done several interviews and, and lectures in the past. Uh, but today we're going to be speaking about A Fiery Gospel, The Battle Hymn of the Republic, and The Road to Righteous War, which is in the uh, Religion and American Public Life series. It's published by Cornell University Press uh, this year. It's very new. Uh, Amazon, at least uh, right now, says it will be released Wednesday, May 15th. Uh, so I believe it's out in Kindle because I have a copy. Uh, thank you very much right. for that, Richard. And um, I'm looking forward to uh, to talking about this. I've been able to look through the book. We're going to talk about it today. But just uh, before we get started in that and start opening up to uh, a bit of American history and uh, national and civil religion, uh, we're going to speak uh, about just a couple things going on. We don't have a whole lot to announce, although it has been a busy time here at Reformed Forum. Uh, and we're delighted to uh, report that uh, the conference for the fall is coming along. We're working on... Um, getting precise uh, conference uh, topics, but our subject matter, as the board has determined, is going to be based on Romans 7.14, uh, where uh, the law is spiritual. So that's a rather, uh, can be a contentious subject, but we want to dive down into the relationship of the law as it was uh, revealed specifically to Moses in that whole redemptive historical era, and how that pertains to the the um, ministry of the Holy Spirit, and especially um, with understanding uh, the age of the Spirit as described in Romans and, and especially in Galatians. So we're going to get to that, but the dates for that are October 11th and 12th, 2019. And so if you'd like to book your, uh, your, your weekend and make sure you've got that free, uh, to come all the way up to, to Grays Lake, Illinois. We look forward to having you. That's, again, October 11th and 12th. We'll have the VIP dinner um, Friday night, uh, the 11th, and then all day Saturday the 12th will be the conference. And um, we're looking forward to having having everybody here back at Hope Orthodox Presbyterian Church. Also, we're hard at work on the, uh, the Wimberley Conference, getting that to video. I just saw a rough cut of it last night of uh, the first the first installment, the first rough cut, and it's looking great. So I want to keep everybody up to date on that and let you know that we hope by the by the fall we'll have something on video that you can use in your churches and in uh, independently on your own and also in, in studies at church. So we're looking forward to all that. Well, that's all I've got. Jeff, do you have anything uh, anything to announce or anything to, to update people regarding? Oh, uh, not not at this point. Yeah, uh, you know, just uh, traveling here and there, doing pulpit supply, going to. Oh be yeah, in, I'm going to be in Memphis, outside of Memphis, in Collierville at Wolf River. Oh, great! Syrian Church on the second of June. Uh, so that'll be my first time in Tennessee. Oh, I love Tennessee. Beautiful. So. I was just uh, had my first time in South Carolina, and I forgot to announce that. But uh, I'll try to put a link that I was I was very privileged to deliver the first uh, Jerry Crick uh, Memorial Lecture in Apologetics uh, at Greenville Seminary. They hosted the event at Taylor's OPC, which is just down the street from the seminary, and had a wonderful time with the brothers there. Um, Love staying with and and uh, spending time with uh, Tony and Kathleen Curto, but uh, the, the entire faculty there is very warm and. 
welcoming and uh, had a lot of good conversations on theology and, and about, on apologetics. So a lot of good folks down there and encourage uh, people to check it out. Uh, Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary and, and uh, the lectures uh, on YouTube. So we'll have a link there as well. Well, let's get into the uh, subject matter today. Looking forward to talking about this, a fiery gospel. Now, Richard, um, I'd like to just open by giving you the opportunity to, to speak perhaps more about your research interests in general and the kinds of things you, you like doing at, at Hillsdale and, and the other types of projects that you've been working on in the past, because I think that'll perhaps provide an entree into this specific subject and help us understand uh, the larger academic, intellectual, theological, historical context for it. Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, I don't think I knew 30 years ago that I was going to end up specializing in American civil religion. Mm. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the First World War and the social gospel clergy in America and trying to understand how these peace advocates, so-called, end up becoming such... uh, such fiery, I'll use that word, uh, such uh, fiery advocates for intervention in the war with such extravagant claims Mm. for what the war would achieve uh, for the redemption of human civilization. And that book was finally published in 2003, as you mentioned, uh, The War for Righteousness. And then I followed up- That was with ISI. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, that's the same outfit that Daryl used to work with, Daryl Hart? Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, And ISI also brought out an anthology that I did, uh, edited about uh, the history of education in the West. Wonderful. Uh, Some primary readings there. Hmm. That's a bit of a sideline for me. Then in 2012, I brought out the book In Search of the City on a Hill, which re-examined the origin of the phrase city on a hill, went back and looked at John Winthrop and the Puritans and looked at his appropriation of the Sermon on the Mount and how that actually made its way into American political rhetoric. It took a surprisingly long time for Americans to start calling themselves a city on a hill. And uh, that reflects my interest. Uh, I don't know the German phrase, probably you do, but there's the type of history called (laughs) reception history. (laughs) Oh, sure, sure. Right. Uh, And and I didn't know I was uh, thinking and writing in a genre, but apparently I am. And it's uh, I'm fascinated by how ideas and a work like the Battle Hymn of the Republic, how it gets received and transmitted and how subsequent history and experience ends up changing, uh, not necessarily changing the meaning of it, but but the use of it changes yeah. over time. The appropriation of it changes right. over time. And one of the things I say at the end of this book uh, is our tendency as historians, especially of American religion, especially evangelical historians of American religion, they ask the question, what did the Bible do to America? And my question is, what did America do to the Bible? Mm -hmm. That's part of that reception history, that transmission history. And what what happens to our faith? What happens to the church? What happens to the Bible when it gets appropriated for purposes alien to it? And I think that runs right through my work. Well, I definitely picked up on that in this book and thought it was tremendous. My favorite sentence of yours in this book, and um, I'm going to read it all all through it uh, very closely, and I'm sure I'll find more, but right at the end in the epilogue, you write, a good memory subverts the purposes of nation building. <laughs> and I find that uh, really useful to see not only how these these main ideas are appropriated from various sources, from the Bible, from other aspects of history, other national myths, and uh, become this sort of, I don't know, fodder this, they, they come into this national milieu. And then all of that through some interesting kind of corporate intellectual activity uh, starts to direct and orient where the nation goes. And then we all come to this, it may be more challenged now with current events, but you know, <laughs> maybe at least three years ago, we would have thought there would be more agreement on some basic ideas. But even today, there's still this core these core aspects of civil religion about what the United States in particular is or what we should be. And um, that's tremendous. That's a real exciting aspect of historical theology. And and people need to know that. And I think even young students realize that history for many can be very boring because they approach it in terms of just names and dates and 
factoids and whatnot, but to think about how ideas change and, and morph and shift and, and not just the ideas change through history, but then the ideas change the history as moving yes. forward and change people. It's really tremendous. And that, that really came through in the book here, A Fiery Gospel. That's great to hear. That's very encouraging. Um, I sometimes joke that I want to make the battle hymn unsingable. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've heard some renditions that were unsingable. unsingable yeah, yeah. Unlistenable. Oh, that's true. That's true. Well, if I could, uh, if I could just tell a personal please. anecdote here about the, the, not, I want to say the practical side of what I've been researching over the years, but I actually came into the OPC because of my research uh, when I was in graduate school, late 80s, early 90s, I was researching, as I mentioned, about the First World War, the social gospel clergy, and I ran into this guy, Jay Gresham Machen. Yeah. I'd never heard of him. And I thought, wow, he, he really knows what's going on. Mm -hmm. He knows what's at stake here. And then I did a postdoc in, uh, at George Mason University, and I opened the Yellow Pages, and I saw the OPC work in Vienna, Virginia, I said, well, you know, as a tribute to Machen, I'm, I'm sure this denomination has gone liberal like every other denomination, but as, <laughs> right. a, as, a, as a tribute to Machen, I'm going to go visit one of his congregations. And I was blown away. Uh, and that got me into the OPC. Uh, and for, for good or ill, I've, I've been here ever since. Yeah. Well, you know, for many of us, we have similar stories. And, uh, you know, I find a little bit of an overlap or at least an echo in my own personal ecclesiastical journey with, with what Machen experienced. And so many of us find home here. Uh, there's, there's, there's some aspects here to, the, to what we're going to be speaking about with the United States and with the OPC. I mean, there's still a mythology to the OPC, and I don't mean that in the, in the sense of, you know, Greek mythology and whatnot, but there's a shared story and a shared history that is definitely operative uh, within the denomination, and we look to that. That can, that can have very good effects. It can also, you know, uh, blind us to other things. So we, it's always helpful to talk about these matters and to understand them. But I think on, on most fronts, we definitely appreciate uh, the churchman uh, ship and the, the work of, of Machen in, in a lot of things, even though he's being called into question today for, for various things of his own time. Um, which we can get into in, in other episodes. Uh, Richard, I was hoping if you could speak with us just to provide an introduction to the, to the Battle Hymn of the Republic, speaking about some of the, the basic historical details in terms of when it was written, or drafted, where it was published, who wrote it, and that sort of thing. I know the whole episode, we're going to talk about its history and its effect, so we can't cover all that in just one question. But uh, in terms of the introductory right. aspects, um, what, are, what are some of the basic features? Yeah, and I'm even going to take a step back here and talk Please. a little bit about the poet, Julia Ward Howe. Oh, even better, yeah. Uh, there are books out there about the Battle Hymn of the Republic. There are biographies out there, including one fairly recent one about Julia Ward Howe, but they're not pursuing the questions I'm pursuing. And uh, I ended up with so much material about Julia Ward Howe digging through the archives in New York, in Boston, that I, I realized I was writing two books at once. I was writing a biography, an intellectual religious biography, mm -hmm. and I was writing a book about the battle hymn. So I hope to get back to that other material. It's, it's really rich, fascinating, complex material. I'm trying to introduce people to a battle hymn they don't know and to a poet they don't know. Uh, Julia Ward Howe, uh, she was not born in Boston. Uh, she was born in Lower Manhattan. Her father was a very successful banker. She came from a very privileged home. He himself, and this is something that, that does not come out in her standard biographies, her parents were very devout evangelical Episcopalians. Uh, he, I have read family letters. Uh, her father was extremely devout man, leading family worship, uh, attended a church, uh, was a member of a church in Manhattan that uh, was a leading church in the evangelical movement within Episcopalianism in the 1820s, 1830s. Her mother was very devout. Her mother's brother was a very prominent Episcopal minister in Brooklyn for decades. And Julia Ward Howe turned away from all of that. 
she was baptized into the church. She was confirmed. She took First Communion in the Episcopal Church, and she turned her back on all of it. And I don't know the whole story yet about that. But certainly by the time she married uh, Samuel Gridley Howe, a very prominent reformer and philanthropist, by the time she married him and moved to Boston, she plunged into radical liberal Unitarianism. She was part of a, a, uh, uh, the avant-garde theologically in America. And uh, we can come back to who her two pastors were in Boston. I think people will find, especially if they know anything about uh, antebellum religious history in America, they'll be astonished at, at who her big influences were. But she was educated uh, as a child uh, at home uh, through tutors who even lived in the home sometimes. She was uh, fluent in French, in German. She knew Italian. She knew uh, Latin, Greek. As an adult, she hired a rabbi in Rome to teach her Hebrew. Uh, she was an astonishing uh, intellect. And she was publishing review essays when she was maybe 16, 17 years old and doing the translations from French and German herself uh, in these translations. And I believe it's there that she was first introduced to a lot of German philosophy and theology, uh, a lot of uh, German literature for sure. She was a great admirer of Goethe, Schiller, but she was reading uh, Kant. Uh, she could never get a, a hold of Hegel, <laughs> which is the experience of a lot of people. Yeah, I was going to say, who can? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. she, uh, she decided at one point that he was intentionally unintelligible, uh, but, but her great favorite was Kant, and she continued to lecture into the 1880s uh, about uh, Kant's influence on America. She was taken very seriously by American philosophers, university uh, presidents, she spoke at the Concord School of Philosophy uh, in the 1880s about uh, German idealism. So she was saturated, absolutely saturated with German philosophical idealism and the theology that went along with it. So should we yeah. take her to Boston now and uh, yeah, well, talk about I, her I'd love to hear there? about that because you know that I would like to read the full biography when you when it when it's available at some point in terms of her religious kind of transition, but understanding right. her ecclesiastical context and and some of the the views and events surrounding the pastors in Boston is is also significant. It, it is, and on a number of levels, because it's just assumed that she was a mainstream American Christian. Uh, people don't pay any attention to what she spent most of her time thinking about and writing about. Yeah. She once pointed to her library, to her granddaughter, and she said, this is what I want to be remembered for. And she's only remembered for one poem. And that has eclipsed almost everything else about her. Uh, so when she went to Boston, and I know you'll know these names, uh, Camden and Jeff, uh, <laughs> she first attended uh, Theodore Parker's church in Boston, uh, the uh, one of the most radical of the liberal Unitarians. Uh, he was in the same circles as Emerson and others in that Harvard Divinity School circle. And uh, he was really uh, really pushing hard uh, to uh, to promote uh, the higher criticism and uh, a, a kind of radical Unitarianism in which Christ almost it almost vanishes uh, the the uniqueness of Christ the 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 identity of Christ. He gets to the point where he's saying, you know, we we await another Christ who will be the truest and highest manifestation of the God spirit, all this kind of stuff. Wow. And that's her pastor and very close family friend. They vacation together. After a while, they leave that church for some murky reasons, and they go off to uh, James Freeman Clark. Now, his, his name is not as familiar anymore, but mm. he was as almost as prominent as Theodore Parker. 
And she was part of his congregation for the rest of his life into the 1880s. So probably from the 1840s to the 1880s. And then she stayed in that church when the, when the next uh, uh, pastor arrived there. And by the way, her dates are 1819 to 1910. Mm. She lived a very long, productive life, and she kept diaries for decades, which uh, very few historians have made any use of. Yeah, that's really interesting to think. Um, you know, speaking a little bit more generally, too, we've, we're talking about issues regarding civil religion and even something of like a national liturgy, which you address early on in the introduction to the book. And it's interesting to see the, the, um, the specific theological and ecclesiastical influences upon Julia Ward Howe, but what, was, what would you say was going on in terms of, I don't know if a better phrase, but like a lowest common denominator in terms of religious awareness. So you have these, you know, more conservative traditional Episcopalian influence upon her early on, and then this really radical Unitarian. But nevertheless, there there seems to be some things that people all all agree on, at least as it, as they seem to be taking shape at the time in the in this uh, 19th century context. How would you how would you describe that in terms of a, a civil religion? What What is that in terms of the way that you pursue it in your intellectual work? Right. I mean, that, it certainly takes a lot of forms, uh, and I, it's easy for me to get lost in the details because you know that historians always want to say on the one hand, on the other hand. Oh, well, scholars. Uh, you know, <laughs> no. We have a weasel words. No one ever wants to say anything definitive in case somebody right. finds something else. <laughs> and editors hate that. They, yeah. they try to oh, get yeah. all those cautionary words right. out of what you write, right. and probably for good reason. Uh, you know, in, in some ways, and I think the historian Daniel Walker Howe has been good in pointing this out over the years, uh, the, the Unitarians, and, the, and as, as soon as I start to generalize, I hesitate, because there are the older Unitarians. There's the first wave of Unitarianism in America, which still defended the authority of Scripture, uh, defended the reality and necessity of miracles, uh, reflected in, in a lot of ways an, an older Arianism. And many of them argued for uh, Unitarianism because they believed it was required by Scripture, that Scripture simply did not uh, teach Trinitarianism. But then there's this new wave of Unitarianism that in which I've situated Julia Ward Howe. Right. But, but all of them uh, participate in the broader Second Great Awakening, mainstream American evangelicalism. They, there is definitely that common denominator which has a very strong sense that the role of the church is to help better America, uh, that the church has a, a primary calling for social service, uh, to help stamp out uh, alcohol, uh, to engage in prison reform, to uh, engage in women's rights, uh, economic reform, and then primarily the abolitionist movement. And, and yeah. Julie Ward Howe was at the core of that movement in Boston. Mm. So, so even the most radical Unitarians, no matter how much they deconstructed Christian theology and any recognizable understanding of, of the church and its calling, they still participated in that broad sweep of Second Great Awakening American evangelicalism. You, you speak in the book about, of course, we've all heard of, Americans at least, the separation of church and state, but you kind of offer a bit of a corrective or at least a suggestion for a different distinction, and that is not a, the distinction between church and state, but that of the relation and distinction between religion and nation. Uh, what kind of vistas uh, does that open up for us? So what, how is that helpful maybe for uh, getting us off one track and thinking in a more productive way? Right. I'm so glad you asked that. Uh, this, this is an idea or a clarification that came to me very late in writing the book. And you've given me a wonderful opportunity here <laughs> to acknowledge a debt uh, that doesn't show up in a footnote there. Uh, just this week, uh, the very distinguished historian John Lukash uh, passed away, oh. 95 years old. Mm. And his books 
have influenced me more than those of any other historian. That idea, the seed of that idea came to me, uh, it, it appeared in an article that he wrote probably back in the 1990s. And this is one more influence that he had on me that uh, I, I would love to acknowledge right now. And it's one of those simple uh, shifts in our vocabulary that opens up this whole vista. And as I said there, and as you just uh, alluded mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. we are in the habit of talking about church and state. We're in the habit of talking about the First Amendment. We're in the habit of there should be no, shall be no religious test for office. We are programmed to think in those terms. But the minute you just shift the, shift the vocabulary and say religion and nation, then we realize that Americans, not uniquely, but Americans uh, throughout their history have integrated, thoroughly integrated religion and nation in a way that often makes them indistinguishable from each other. You know, we could go back and talk about uh, the colonial settlers. We could go back and talk about the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, the First World War. Americans expect a certain level of religiosity uh, in our public ceremonies, yeah. whether it's in front of the courthouse here in Hillsdale. Right. Um, you know, we will have we will still have a manger scene there uh, because nobody. Nobody gets worked up about that in this small town. And we will have all the civil religious ceremonies uh, mm -hmm. with generic prayers uh, and that. And, and if you raise questions about that, as you well know, if you raise any questions about that, that kind of generic faith, then all kinds of people uh, react very strongly to that. This is a very sensitive issue. And maybe we can, maybe we can bracket that off for a whole uh, conversation yeah, about sure. about why this is such a sensitive question because right. it's so easy for people to misunderstand what I'm doing. Uh, I I come in as the guy who reigns on the parade, and and I'm trying to police boundaries between things mm -hmm. that that matter very much. But yeah, this is an American habit, but it is not a uniquely American habit. Uh, what what a lot of European nations roll their eyes over about American religiosity, that this is in their own past. Uh, it's in their, uh, in their nationalism in, in their past. Yeah, we see a lot of debates like this. I mean, every day in the headlines, I mean, as, as we record, what's going on is Democratic uh, candidates are trying to gear up all 5,000 of them to decide who's going to run against President Trump and one who's been getting a lot of play recently, at least in the intersection between uh, religion and nation, is uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg. And, right. and he's arguing quite, you know, vociferously that uh, the Republican Party doesn't own God. But then he also says if God was a Republican or was, you know, a member of a party, he sure wouldn't be a Republican. Well, that's a, that's a good point that God, God right. isn't owned by a political party. But it, it also, it, it just brings up a whole bunch of issues in terms of how how the Bible has been used, how different people treat it. You know, um, you know, some of the morning shows you watch, whatnot, and I, I sometimes, you know, dip in and watch a Morning Joe, and I'll, I'll probably be castigated by a lot of people for that. <laughs> I'm an independent myself. I'm an extremely conservative one for on many things, but I watch that because I like a lot of the commentators and whatnot, and I like getting other perspectives, as is good for everybody. But they, they'll often butt in. And uh, they were responding to Franklin Graham recently, for example, and his comments regarding homosexuality, etc. And um, saying Jesus didn't, you know, they go off on this whole theological right. thing about what what is right and wrong and what Jesus really taught and how Jesus never taught about homosexuality and d dividing Jesus from the rest of them, all sorts, you, you name it, you know. Right. And right. then and uh, you you just see that this is just part of the mix, and and then yes. and everyone has different presuppositions, different assumptions. Uh, about the Bible, about what it is, how it's supposed to be used. But generally speaking, uh, everybody, most Americans, at least those in public discourse and those involved in the, the polit political process, have a basic idea that the president ought to be doing these kinds of things. Uh, we believe in freedom. We believe in, you know, independence, all these kinds of things. And, and that's 
insightful for me, at least to read your book and to understand that, that there's a, there's a cultural national liturgy as it were. And there, when we think of the relation between religion and nation, it's not just, uh, um, the nation deciding how much to allow the church to engage in terms of their worship and, and whatnot, but in, but in terms of the nation, you know, invoking things into their own processes. And it's a two-way street on that, on that front. And that's what's that's what we're really talking about here with the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Not just how much God stuff can be said in in uh, official state business, but how these ideas and these practices influence not only the state but also the church and and vice versa. It goes both ways. So it's not it's not just a risk for the state to be changed by these ideas, but also the church has been significantly altered and affected as well. Right. Absolutely. You're, uh, you're singing my song. <laughs> <laughs> you get an A in the class. Hey, Cameron. cool. There Thanks. Uh, honorary, uh, honorary degree. <laughs> yeah. You're keeping me from grading final exams right now. Well, so, uh, we, we can talk for days if you like. Jeff too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jeff, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, we, I'd love well, to start I've, diving I've into the, to the I hymn, mean, but this was, uh, as some of the listeners probably know, my sixth great grandfather, financed the Revolutionary War. So there's a personal element involved uh, in this. But but I very early uh, in my studies of Edwards came to see the the uh, complex situation in this in this country uh, due to the due to the at least in New England due due to the Puritan founding of the of, of New England. And there was no expectation of what we would call uh, distinction between nation uh, and religion, certainly, and certainly not even uh, there, there would have been a distinction between the magistrate and the pastor, the church and the state, but there would not have been a separation uh, in the, in the way that we're used to. But I remember reading Alan Heimer's book on American uh, religion uh, and doing a review for it and, and becoming aware of the, the fact that, that, uh, uh, the situation we're in today is basically the the result of an evolution or de- devolution of that that uh, sacred canopy which uh, the founding fathers and mothers uh, held to the the covenant idea, the national covenant, uh, and that's kind of secularized uh, in American life now, uh, even if it's there anymore. But it was, you know, for a time. And all of this, uh, the the writing of the Battle Hymn of the Republic, its life is a, a song. Uh, Machen's complaining about the singing of it in the church. Yeah. Uh, all of all of that is a res- is a result of the the fact that human beings occupy different roles. They can be a Christian. They can be a a member of of America. You know, of the founding uh, generation. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so this is all, but as, as Richard says, this is not unique to America, really. Uh, we do have, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's manifested itself in a p- particular way in this land, but it's not unique to us. Uh, but this is all, this is all very, very much still, as you've said, Camden, it's mm. l- live history it, it's oh yeah not we're living it something that we've gotten beyond right <laughs> we're still living with this and we really do i think and this is where richard's work is so helpful is is the 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 boundaries that he's policing are boundaries that need to be policed mm-hmm. uh, on both sides by the by either on the side of the nation or the side of the of religion yeah uh need they need the boundaries need to be clear so that people yeah recognize that when God's name is invoked in a, in a Memorial Day prayer, that it's not necessarily right. the God of the, of the triune God of Scripture who's being, whose name is being invoked. And that, that's really what you know, we're getting at here, especially with the Civil War. We have, we have the North and the South, uh, both of them think that they have God on their side. Um, there's a tremendous book by Mark Knoll on the, the religious uh, history of the Civil War. I, I'm probably mangling that title, but you can find it if you do a search. It's a tremendous book. Um, I think it's this Civil War is a theological crisis, if I remember. I think that's correctly. right. That's it. And that's that's, that's a tremendous book, which gets at that, and it, it explains how even theologically the North had really bad 
scriptural arguments until later in the war. And then after, after they came up with kind of a better hermeneutic, they started to have more progress <laughs> among, among some of the people that were really looking at their Bibles. But this, this leads into the more specific issue here of the Battle Hymn of the Republic. And I'm curious as to Julia Ward Howe's immediate uh, context. What was she experiencing at the, at the time that the Battle Hymn was written? Well, first off, when was it written or drafted? Where was it published? And what was going on in her mind and in the nation right then, Not uh, having already kind of addressed some of her context leading up to that point? Right. One of the things I've been able to do in this book uh, to make a, I believe, make an important contribution is to reconstruct exactly that experience you're talking about. There have been resources available to us that we didn't know were about uh, her week in Washington, D.C., when, mm. when she experienced so much of the front lines of the war, was inspired to write the poem. So I'm, I'm very excited about uh, what, to be able to share what we now know about the immediate context there. Uh, I can even talk about the sermon she heard yeah, the, uh, hear less than two days before mm -hmm. she wrote the poem. So that, that, that has not happened before. So she, um, her husband was very active on the philanthropic side, a, a medical doctor, graduate of, of Harvard Medical School, he ran an institute for the deaf and blind in Boston. And when the war broke out, he and other uh, philanthropists, ministers, politicians uh, formed uh, the, uh, what was called the United States Sanitary Commission. Uh, a funny word today. Uh, it sounds like their job was to keep things clean. But, uh, it had to do with providing aid to soldiers, very practical aid to the soldiers in their encampments, uh, to help families, to provide soldiers with some of the necessities uh, and even some of the uh, like a, a deck of playing cards or something like that. This is explaining my my something I've long misunderstood because in baseball I always had to buy and wear sanitary socks. And I wondered like, <laughs> what are these <laughs> necessities? You you just you just there solved you the mystery for me. There you go. <laughs> and uh, so he was active, and and he and the governor of Massachusetts uh, were close friends, and they would go back and forth to D.C. quite often in the early months of the war. But Julia Ward Howe and some of the other wives, uh, they wanted to go along too. And on one of these trips in November of 1861, the wives came along, the governor's wife, her pastor's wife, uh, and she came along and a few others. And she got to see wartime Washington, D.C. mobilized. Let's, let's remind ourselves exactly where we are in the story here. Uh, Lincoln, of course, elected in November of 1860, took office in March of 1861, firing on Fort Sumter, April 1861, uh, some early setbacks for Union forces in the summer of 1861, uh, first Bull Run, and so on. And the war was not going well at all for the Union uh, into the fall of 1861. And she, Julie Ward Howe, was looking for some way that she could help in the war effort. Uh, she was an established poet. She had been publishing poetry since at least the 1850s. She was highly respected by Nathaniel Hawthorne, among others. And she was just looking for a way to help. She had been active in benevolent organizations. She had been uh, very active in the abolitionist movement. And at the same time, she was also just a tourist. Uh, she yeah. wanted to take in the sights of, mm -hmm. of a very, at a very exciting moment in, in the history of, of the Capitol. She uh, stayed right in downtown uh, DC and made a couple of trips over into Northern Virginia. Uh, she and her friends would take a carriage, travel out, visit the troops because a lot of the uh, Massachusetts regiments were sta stationed right there across the Potomac. So they were actually able to go and visit uh, men and officers whom they knew personally. And they would have a meal with them. They would uh, visit her pastor on Sunday afternoon, went out to preach to the, to the troops. So this is the kind of thing she's busy with. And uh, on one of these occasions, actually more than one occasion, but uh, on an important occasion, she came out to 
witness a grand military display. She saw, as I said, more than one during her time in D.C. But as she was uh, surveying the troops, reviewing the troops, uh, there was a skirmish with Confederates at, at one extreme end of, of the Union line. And uh, the, the visiting party had to quickly pack up, and all the other tourists who had come out for that day had to pack up and head back into D.C. And just like today, there's a major traffic jam <laughs> trying to get back into D.C. from yeah. suburban Virginia. 95, uh, it's all backed up. <laughs> all backed up. <laughs> so as she's, her carriage is just crawling uh, at the pace that the soldiers are, are marching along the side of the road. And they were singing some of their favorite songs. They asked her to sing. She was noted as a gifted musician, pianist, and vocalist. And they were singing their favorite marching song, John Brown's Body. Yeah. Which of course, is the tune that is now associated with the battle hymn. And the story she tells, which I have some doubts about, but the story that she tells 30-some years later is that her pastor said, uh, why don't you write better words to that splendid tune? And she claimed later that that was the spark for her. And she went to sleep that night. She woke up early the next morning in the hotel. It wasn't even light yet. She scrambled around for paper and a pencil. And she wrote out what were originally six verses of the battle hymn. Yeah. And only five of those were published in her at that time. And you can see uh, in the stanzas exactly the kinds of things she had been witnessing ever since her train made the last leg of its trip from Baltimore to D.C. all the way through the visits to these encampments. It's reflected in this poetry. Wow. And, they, and um, the draft, at least that first copy of manuscript, still exists by some really extraordinary uh, graces and uh, you 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 include that toward the end of the book some of that history which was you know recently unveiled and and uh, if I recall correctly there were very few at least the, the what what we see as the original very few changes there was what only four words or things that were altered right uh, at it's, least in the copy very that, little that yeah. that that still exists today right now um. Go oh, ahead. Go, oh, I was going to ask, and but, but please uh, feel free to pause and, and stop me. But I was going to ask more specifically, what did how draw upon literarily in writing right. this? If this was the historical right. context, what did she use as inspiration or other sources to provide the the words that actually were used to express her experience? One thing that becomes obvious in this poem when you do a close reading of it is that she knew her Bible cover to cover. She didn't necessarily handle her Bible correctly, but right. she knew her Bible. <laughs> mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. one of the things I try to emphasize in the book that this is not original with me at all, but uh, mid-19th century America is a biblically literate culture. Yeah. This is how many people learn to read. This is they 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 have the cadence, the vocabulary of the King James Version yeah. in their mind. So, yeah, to assume with just hearing biblical language in a po politician doesn't necessarily mean uh, <laughs> they're right. orthodox. Take George and Washington, that, Lincoln, for example. Is, Who knows what they actually believe? That is such an important point. Uh, yes. And it's more important, often more important, to notice what they never say yeah. uh, rather than what they say. Mm. So she, her use of archaic language, uh, mine eyes have seen, you know, this is... This is poetic language. It has this elevated poetic style, but it sounds like the King James Version. Uh, that phrase appears very rarely in Scripture, but we might want to think of the prayer of Simeon, uh, you know, mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Uh, who knows? That's me speculating, but mm -hmm. it has that flavor to it. It mm -hmm. sounds like the Bible. Mm -hmm. But then much more explicitly, she's picking up... Uh, really violent judgment imagery from the book of Isaiah and that as that language is echoed in Revelation. I believe Revelation 14, is that it, perhaps where it appears with the uh, grapes of wrath and trampling oh, out sure. the vintage of God's wrath? Mm -hmm. uh, so when her 
audience, her readers saw that language, they knew immediately that she was appropriating both the Old and the New Testament and saying, uh, this is what her eyes witnessed there on the battlefields, there in the encampments. These soldiers were the army of the Lord. Mm -hmm. so they're building him an altar in the evening dews and damps. And it, it draws loosely at some points, but specifically at others, drawing from images perhaps of Gideon and his army, perhaps Joshua and his army. And we even have in the Old Testament, uh, as folks know, you know the, the building of altars uh, associated with these with these armies. So she is she is channeling a great deal of scripture. Uh, mm. And I think even in the discarded sixth verse, she might be working with Psalm 110. Uh, so there, there's a lot going on here. But then as soon as I say all that, I've got to flip to the <laughs> other side and say, yeah. One of the keys to this poem being so durable is how general it is. Right. It never mentions the Civil War. It never says America. It never says uh, North, South. It never directly mentions the institution of slavery, other than those famous last lines about, as he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. You don't get a statement about emancipation. And I think this is also, it's quite similar to Lincoln's Gettysburg Address from 1863, uh, just two years after she wrote this poem. Lincoln achieves very similar results. And we have to check ourselves. If I say this to people, they say, oh, this can't be true. But then they go back and read the text of the Gettysburg Address and they see that it doesn't say North, South, never mentions Gettysburg. Uh, it, 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 it speaks in this very evocative language that is then so easily appropriated uh -huh. symbolically mm. by later generations. And that's part of the reason why the battle hymn just goes on and on and on. Well, there's tremendous literary skill in that because just the power in, in people's assumptions. I mean, you're almost writing in a way, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that people can latch onto it and import what they want into this work, into this right. hymn. And then to, and it's done in such a kind of natural way where the appropriator, whoever that is, either in 1861 or in uh, 2019, just assumes that how and the hymn are, is on their side, whatever side that is. That's it it exactly just, you just right. own it and you feel like, yeah, this person understands me, but exactly. may or may not. I do have a question, though. I mean, do, where in the scriptures uh, is it mentioned that Christ was born in the beauty of the lilies? Just, just, <laughs> just, uh, Jeff, just a question. Right. Now, Jeff, you've, I'm laughing because you've put your finger on the most mysterious part of a uh, mysterious poem. Uh, we have, we've had all kinds of speculation over the last 150 years, and she herself never definitively answered that question. I, I think one of the best suggestions, explanations, is that she's associating the lilies with artistic depictions in medieval and Renaissance art of oh, right. Virgin Mary being presented with the lilies by the angel Gabriel at the Annunciation. That doesn't really mm. make sense, though, mm -hmm. uh, when you read yeah. the text of the poem. So I'm not entirely convinced by that. Yeah. Uh, and it is a strange, strange verse, that last verse, in the beauty of the lilies, Christ was born across the sea with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. Um, you know, and what does transfiguration mean there? It's a very odd way of speaking of redemption because she doesn't believe in the atonement. <laughs> uh, we could have a long conversation about what she doesn't believe. Yeah. She doesn't believe anything, <laughs> anything, affirmed by the Apostles' Creed. Uh, so all of this has become highly abstract, redemptive language. So uh, that uh, this, that's fascinating uh, in its own right, but I'm really interested in understanding how the hymn was received early on. And then uh, how, how was it published? How was it made known? And then how did it become something that was that was sung as Union soldiers were marching 
I mean, they had right. other songs. Uh, how, how did <laughs> how right. did this one uh, this one become the one? One of uh, I think one of the misunderstandings about the poem, which is commonplace and has been repeated so often, is that it was a favorite of the soldiers. Mm. There is surprisingly little evidence that that was ever the case. Yeah, they really didn't like it. Many of them, right? Well, and they well, thought the they thought that you could never march into battle singing, for example, in the beauty of the lilies. I mean, who's going to face <laughs> enemy gunfire right, right. and artillery singing in the beauty yeah. of the lilies? And they they <laughs> always preferred their original, the original doggerel of the John Brown song. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how it became popularized is is a fascinating question because this is a this is one one example of how we in 2019 actually have the opportunity to know more about its original popularity than Julia Ward Howe ever did because of the incredible digital resources we have uh, how we can search newspapers something like newspapers.com or the Library of Congress uh, I've been able to to find more than I could ever possibly use, more examples mm. of this poem appearing uh, immediately in January of 1862. Mm. Um, to answer your further er, earlier question, yeah. and to organize my thoughts here, it no was trouble. the poem was purchased by the Atlantic Monthly magazine. Yeah, uh, she was already a regular contributor of poetry and essays to the Atlantic Monthly in Boston. Her editor purchased the poem, featured it on the front page of the February 1862 uh, issue. He's the one who gave it the name, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It did not have that title. Yeah. And as still happens today, there are these preview copies and announcements sent out to newspapers. So a month earlier, in the middle of January, the New York Times already knows what, what the table of contents is for the forthcoming Atlantic Monthly. They know that there's a poem by Julia Ward Howe. They have a copy of the poem. It appears first anywhere in print in the pages of the New York Herald Tribune, uh, probably the largest circulation newspaper in America, perhaps the largest circulation newspaper in the world. And uh, uh, Horace Greeley, the editor of that, was a very prominent social reformer. So that's where it appeared, and it was picked up by newspapers all across the country, especially New England, Upper Midwest, uh, California. And I, I believe that Julie Ward Howe died not knowing just how many people had seen her poem. Oh. In fact, more people, clearly more people had seen this one poem than anything else she had ever published. Wow. That's, that's pretty obvious. And she lived 49 more years, correct? Right, right. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. And she was lucid and still writing uh, in her diary up to the very end. Wow. Um, so it's, yeah, and it's picked up. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one, um, one story. Part of the, part of the puzzle, the mystery is the intersection between Julia Ward Howe and uh, evangelicalism. Mm. How does this poem get picked up? and embraced almost immediately by American evangelicals, whose yeah. theology is totally different from right. her theology. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, and one of the things we notice in the poem is that there is nothing distinctly, uh, definitively Unitarian about it. So it has that vagueness we were talking about earlier, not only vagueness historically about the circumstances, but a vagueness theologically which makes it very easy for uh, perhaps naive Christians to start singing. But there was, a, uh, there was a chaplain, a Methodist chaplain by the name of McCabe, and he read the poem in the Atlantic Monthly. He committed it to memory. And later when he was imprisoned in Libby Prison in Virginia, Richmond. He sang it with the uh, with the inmates there uh, and taught them the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Mm. And then he had quite a career. He sang it in front of President Lincoln. He uh, he uh, sang it uh, as a fundraiser for all kinds of organizations. And I think I just slipped there a second ago. I think Jeff caught me uh, about Libby Prison. In, in yes. Richmond, yeah. 
Yeah, in Richmond. Good catch. Wow. So, uh, so it it spread very widely, and it started appearing in sermons. I have examples, surprisingly early, of how quickly some New England clergymen were incorporating the poem uh -huh. into their into their sermons. Her own pastor. Uh, started using it in the pulpit in Boston, mm. and from there it just spread and spread and spread. Uh, in that in that regard, you know, we think of it so bound up with the Civil War that was its original context, but it it endured uh, obviously for many many years. Uh, what did what did How do after the Civil War was concluded? Did this hymn? I mean, obviously it followed her around, but it did it ever pose problems for her later on? Was it an advantage? that she had written this? Um, how, how did it affect her life after the war? Right. That's a great question. And uh, it's a little too complex to map out. <laughs> Part of what I try to do in the book here is I, I try to make the case that she starts remembering the poem and the war in a different way uh -huh. because she becomes so closely identified with the poem. And she starts quoting it as a way to explain her own emotions at the time. And that may not sound like a strange thing to do, but but she starts reading the significance of the Civil War and the significance of America and of America's future wars by quoting the lines of her own poetry. Mm. And it's even it's the Spanish-American War, right? What's that? Spanish-American War in 18, 1898 yes. with the similar thing. Right. So right. this has become kind of this like living biographical appendage, I suppose, to right. her. She and lives her she, life through it, kind of. Sometimes she loved the celebrity it brought her, and sometimes oh. she hated it. Uh, she was once called in, an, in a newspaper a mono-poet, that she was known for only one poem, and <laughs> I... <laughs> <laughs> and she, that she, that's a, all she, she would be, ever she be known a, for. And a victim ways, of that, her success. That out to be prophetic. Yeah, uh, a, a, pr precisely. And that, <laughs> that's what people know her for. But I guess it is that having such a wild success, that's all that people ever know you for, a victim right. of it. Right. A one-hit wonder. Man. Yeah, exactly. Who has and many hits. <laughs> you know, that frustrated her. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. She had written so much poetry. Sure. Uh, poetry that was popular during the Civil War. Poems like My Country, The Flag, very well known, but she was reduced down to this to this one poem. But then she made the best of it. She it was being sung all over the world. It was being translated into foreign languages, Armenian, oh, wow. uh, yeah. Italian. Uh, so she she knew later that it was the key to her fame, international mm -hmm. fame and mm -hmm. her own daughters. Uh, continued to promote this as a cottage industry. They wrote they wrote books about the battle hymn, and and wow. they became very defensive about the reputation of that poem and the proper interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. uh, you you mentioned that Howe kind of viewed the America at the in 1898 or thereabouts of the Spanish American War as having moved from an Old Testament era to a New Testament era. What, what does she mean by that, and how does that reveal something about her and how she treated this poem? Right. Um, that's one of my favorite things she ever said. It's almost as if I made it up just for her to say it. Uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's a great historian at, uh, at Penn, uh, Walter McDougall, and he wrote a book in the 1990s called Promised Land Crusader State, and this was his chosen metaphor to say America had its old its Old Testament of its foreign policy and ideology as a promised land, a refuge, and then its New Testament of being missionary evangelistic, trying to transform other parts of the world. And he's not a fan. So yeah. here's Julia Ward Howe. Maybe we're Old Testament again now, I guess. <laughs> we're yeah. having a fight over yeah. this right now. Yeah. Right. So then here she is in about 1900 when there are American troops, uh, U.S. Marines in China in the context of the Boxer Rebellion. She's very excited about this. And she said uh, in these uh, impromptu remarks that she recorded in her diary and are recorded elsewhere from people who were present, she said, it is time for us to turn from our Old Testament of liberty for ourselves to our New Testament of liberty for others. So here she is making the same point that a scholar will make later, but she's she's calling upon America to mm. embrace this global 
redemptive mission. Uh, and she has always had a global vision. She was a, a great proponent of the nationalist movements in Europe all the way back to the 1840s. She was a supporter of Hungarian independence, uh, Polish uh, reunification, Italian unification, German unification. She was she believed that this was the trajectory of history, uh, that this was part of the dialectic of history. Uh, and so even then on after the Civil War, she's she's seeing the unification of Italy in 1870 as a fulfillment of God's plan for history. And she sees that all the way down to 1900 and beyond that America is is in a sense, obeying her battle hymn. It is dying to make men free Yeah, uh, way beyond America's borders. What did you, you mentioned it was, it has been translated, but did the, did this poem, the hymn ever become appropriated in any public way in other countries? Was it ever appealed to as some sort of mission or civil religion that the, the country, or at least a, a faction of a country should sign up for? Right. Um, in England, it had a very surprising uh, longevity. It is wow. still sung there today. Really? To, uh, yes, it's in the uh, it's in the Church of England hymn book. Wow. <laughs> uh, and they love the sixth sixth verse that she discarded. Uh, that's a quirky story about how that became well known. Uh, so it is, it has been used. It's been used as a way to. Uh, Celebrate America as a valued ally. You know, this is how the British are likely to use it in World War One, World War Two, Cold War. Uh, but definitely, others have sung it uh, as uh, as capturing this vision of of human emancipation, uh, of of national liberation. So the way it's being used to interpret. Uh, World War One. Later, uh, the way it's uh, sung, it's sung in Constantinople and Istanbul wow. uh, in the 1870s uh, as part of this wider vision for um, for human liberation. In that case, against the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Well, I always hear it. Uh, most years, I go back to my to my uh, homeland, my hometown. Very small town, uh, still to this day has no stoplights. It's that small, uh, but we have an old uh, an old cemetery in town. My brother serves on the board of it now. But there's you know Revolutionary War uh, soldiers that are buried there. Most of my the Busey side, my family is buried there. Maybe someday I'll be buried there myself. But they always sing the battle hymn uh, at the Memorial Day service. I might not make it this year on the 27th, but. Uh, Perhaps I will, but that always reminds me that this is just part of this this thing, you know. And the right. church choir comes to sing it. Uh, the church where I grew up, which with the church itself, was founded in 1844. So there's a long history there. Who knows how many times that that, that hymn has been sung, not just right. by church people, but in the church services. So I want to ask you. I mean, as we as we think about this more from a contemporary viewpoint, um, how does the battle hymn? function today and just you know i know this is trying to condense an entire long scholarly book into kind of one little short tidbit but uh you know i know we're not a, a morning news cycle where we're just giving you one minute <laughs> to tell us right. what this book's about at the same time do you find do you find this battle hymn being more of a, a hindrance uh than a help or uh, you know how uh, help us to understand this and and how can we kind of think about the use of the battle hymn moving forward in perhaps a more intelligent, measured way, at least those of us who are confessionally reformed. Right, exactly. Um, I, it certainly does not belong in our public worship. Mm. Uh, that it, it is such a mangling of biblical text and theology. Uh, it is a, 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 a confessional Christian cannot, cannot accept this reuse of the Bible for the purposes of America's wars and for uh, sustaining the American nation state. And, and this is, this is part of that complexity we we're talking about earlier. You can be patriotic, you can love your country and you can love your church. And here in America, we are spoiled rotten. We mm -hmm. have, we still have the ability to love our country and love our church. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you are singing a song about, America's redemptive mission, 
written by a woman who denied every doctrine of the faith, uh, there's something serious wrong. So yeah. I, I, in a way, I want to give people a bad conscience about, about this hymn. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, I want people to understand that this, the battle hymn is far more violent and apocalyptic than people realize, because they're not paying attention to the words. They, they don't, you know, they just, just sing along about God trampling out the vintage uh, where the grapes of wrath are stored. This is, this is some of the bloodiest imagery of the Old and New Testament. And if we take yeah. that out of the context of God's mm -hmm. righteous judgment, it's, it's horrifying. Yeah, uh, people throw a fit over singing impregatory psalms. Those are inspired <laughs> words. Those are God's inspired oh. words. Camden, Camden, I think I love you. <laughs> um, it's wild. I, <laughs> anyway, I, that that's that's a fantastic point. Uh, you not only pass the course, uh, you now get an A, <laughs> get a prize. Uh, that's right. Uh, wow, that's well, extra credit right there. Now, even those yeah. we want to always explain within the redemptive historical context, but I don't shy away from we we sing an impregatory psalm here or there. I always right. try to explain right. it and understand, but uh, this is, you know, the Lord will come in, in judgment and wrath. He's he right. stayed that for a time, but his his uh, his medium and his 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 forces for bringing that wrath are, is not the United States of America. Right. As and, much of a patriot as I am, it's just not the case. Right. And maybe we can uh, e extend the analogy here. I, there is no redemptive historical context for the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Yeah. Yeah. There is for the imprecatory songs. Yeah, sure. But there is not for the Battle Hymn of mm -hmm. the Republic. It, right. it cannot be baptized and brought into the church for public worship. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, I, I, no, nobody's going to ask me for permission to sing it uh, in uh, on the 4th of July out in the public square. But there, too, I think. I think Christians have to be very cautious about about what they sing, what they affirm in public by singing these words. And I know this gets difficult. I know there's the question of good manners, and I struggle with this myself. I struggle with this with the Pledge of Allegiance. Mm. Uh, what is what is called? What is expected of us simply as good manners, and not to draw attention to ourselves? by some some act of civil disobedience in this way or right. so, so I don't I, I don't know what to tell people to do in every circumstance but uh, the more you know about the battle hymn the less singable it is <laughs> yeah well I think that's that's a lesson for the day I mean Richard this has been really fascinating and uh, just opened my eyes to all sorts of of uh, of things I did not know before so thanks for joining us today and for uh, speaking not only to us, but sharing this with all of our listeners, and, and most of all for for writing the book. This has been tremendous. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Camden. I I have uh, benefited so much from your work with Reform Forum, Boss Group. Mm. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Well, praise uh, God. I've, yeah. So, and Jeff, it's great to talk with you as yes, well. you too. Well, I got to say, you know, everyone needs to get a copy of this book, A Fiery Gospel, The Battle Hymn of the Republic and the Road to Righteous War. Again, in the Religion and American Public Life series is published by Cornell University Press. Don't let that scare you if you're not a scholar or a, a, an historian. It is a university press, but this is a tremendously readable book. And uh, any any literate adult, you know, should be able to, to follow this just fine. And it, it's tremendously well written. And a uh, lot of insightful material there. And it is well-researched and all, so the scholars are not going to be lacking either. But it's a book for everybody, so take a look at it. Um, you can find it uh, online. You know, I've got a copy on Kindle, so you can find it there right now, I believe. And you can also get it uh, in hardcover uh, at least by Wednesday, May 15th. But you can pre-order it now, and we'll have uh, links to that in the episode description. So everybody will be able to find it there. If you'd like to get in touch with us, uh, you can get a hold of us at reformedforum.org. There you'll find information about everything we're doing, all of our programs, resources, publications, and upcoming events. But I do want to thank everybody for listening. We do hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.